All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our personal preparedness webinar. My name is Anne LeSage. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Bainbridge Island. And you're here today to learn about how to get prepared at home, in your cars, at work, et cetera. And so we have a lot of good information to share. I will introduce my co-panelist, Tyler Heineman. He is the program director for Bainbridge Prepares. Tyler, you want to say anything? Oh, I'm still writing responses. Uh, hello, <laughs> program director for Bainbridge Prepares. Uh, just here to help Anne today. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. I will let Tyler share with the group how you can uh, type in questions. And if you want your response answered live while I'm getting the PowerPoint ready, I will let him share how to do that. Okay, so there is a um, button at the bottom of your screen. It might depend on whether what operating system you're on, but uh, down in the bottom panel, there's a Q&A button. If you press that, there will be a place where you can type in your questions. If you have a burning question that you just have to ask by voice, then you can raise your hand. And when we get to a break, we can give you the option to speak your question. So feel free to drop any questions, comments uh, into the Q&A. The chat is disabled for this webinar. We'll look at settings to get that set up for next time. All right, great. Thank you, Tyler. All right, so we will go ahead and dive into the presentation and our slides. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what the heck could go wrong? What are the different types of threats that could impact us here on Bainbridge Island? And we're gonna talk about all of the different things that you need to have for your emergency kit. So we're gonna talk in detail about putting together your go bag, what types of supplies you should have in your car, at work and of course at home and then what are some other things you can do to plan for these various types of disasters ways to stay informed and how you can get involved and of course we'll talk a little bit about our bainbridge prepares partnership i know a number of you on this call are our current volunteers but we also have a number of individuals from within the community that may not know a lot about our partnership and so we want to share some information with you about the work that we're doing to prepare the island and to partner with other jurisdictions within Kitsap County and beyond and then we will have time at the end for for questions as well all right so what the heck could go wrong? Hopefully none of these hazards are new to you. We've experienced quite a few of them here, and there's certainly things that threaten us in the Pacific Northwest. So we live in earthquake country. As you know, um, and if you've been following any of the, the news as of late, we are in the Cascadia subduction zone. And then of course, we also have the Seattle fault line right, running right through the island. And so we are concerned about earthquakes and the, the impact of, of earthquakes also causing tsunami. The, the King Tide event that we had just a few weeks ago showed some really vulnerable areas on the island from that storm surge and with sea level rise. Of course, we're thinking about the impact to, to Bainbridge landslides, wildfire, I know I continue to hear from within the community kind of mixed feedback regarding the true threat of wildfires to Bainbridge and really the landscape over the last 10 years in Western Washington has changed and the threat has become much more real. You know, prior to 10, 12 years ago, the majority of fires in Washington were in central and Eastern Washington. And last year and the year before, I think were the first two years that we had more on the west side. So we're seeing an increased threat and we'll share some resources with you on where you can get additional information and some of the plans that between the fire department and the city that we have in place for wildfire preparedness, mitigation, and then of course, uh, evacuation and response um, should that happen. Severe wind and rain, and um, I think our, our favorite, Snowmageddon, you know, we 
tend to drive very well in the rain, but maybe not so much in the snow and the ice. And we're just not as prepared for the extreme temperatures that we've had and the snow and ice that we had in December this year showed some real impact to our roads, to our ability to get around and go to the grocery store, pick up prescriptions, things like that. So we wanna make sure we are prepared for winter weather. And who could forget the last three years of our lives have been consumed with our response to a global pandemic and how that really changed how we work and how we interact with other individuals. And hopefully nothing like this ever happens again in our lifetime, but we wanna make sure we're aware for a pandemic and just general public health threats. So lots to think about in terms of the why. One thing I wanna say is that we, and we being the, the Bainbridge Prepares Partnership, we take an approach to this that is all hazards. And so while any one of these things could and will happen, we want to make sure that we're just prepared in general. So everything that we do to be prepared at home, at work, et cetera, is impactful, whether it is a, a wind event or a snow event or an earthquake, we have the things that we need in order to respond. So let's talk about stuff, all the different things that you need to be prepared. So we're gonna go into detail on building your go bag, your evacuation kit for your house, talk a little bit about what you need in your car and at work if you go into work. I know a lot of folks are now telecommuting, some full-time, and so even more important to have supplies at home if your home is also your workplace. And then we'll talk about the things that you should have in your home disaster kit for at least 14 to 30 days minimum. All right. So first up is your go bag. The first question that I get a lot is, you know, how should I store our go bag? And, you know, really the simple answer is something that is easy for you to grab and something that is easy for you to carry. So if it's a backpack, a duffel bag, a rolling duffel bag, something on wheels, something that you can um, you know, throw on your back and quickly get into your car and, and get out of your house if needed, something that is mobile. So let's start there. And then what are the kind of things that you should have in there? So think about, and I'll use wildfire as an example. So think about a wildfire scenario where there's a wildfire going on, maybe there's a threat, it's already on the island, or there's the threat of it, um, you know, happening on the island because of the weather scenario, let's say it's a, a red flag warning, and we just want to be thinking about, okay, what would I need if I'm grabbing this bag or two, throwing it in my car and, and driving away? What would I want to have in there? And so this is sort of that initial list of things that you should have in your go bag. Bottles of water. I would also add to that some sort of, you know, life straw or, you know, water filtration device would be a great thing as well. But definitely just a few bottles of water, some snacks a first aid kit, flashlight or headlamp and batteries, copies of key documents. You wanna make sure you have photocopies of your driver's license, your passport, your insurance cards, your health insurance, car insurance, pet insurance, homeowners. Think about all of the key insurance documents that I would physically have a paper copy of. You can also upload PDFs onto a thumb drive, update that once a year, keep that thumb drive in, your go bag, a change of clothes and sturdy shoes, cash, small bills and change. One thing that I do for the key documents and cash is I print out my key documents. I fold them in half in the middle of the papers where I keep all of my small bills and change. So ones, fives, tens, twenties and change. And then I put that in a gallon size Ziploc so that it's fairly waterproof. And then I keep that in all of the different types of bags that we're talking about today, all the type of kits. And then once a year, I update it and um, occasionally have just needed the cash in an emergency. I'm like, oh, yeah, I have that in my work backpack or, or in my car. Personal hygiene supplies, things like toothbrush, toothpaste, medication, again, things that, you know, you would need to sustain yourself for a couple days away from your house. And then any items specific to your particular household. So if you have 
an infant or you have a child with a food allergy or you take care of a family member that's elderly that has certain types of durable medical equipment or oxygen or particular medication needs. You wanna make sure that you have necessary items. And then for pets, you have a collar and a leash, their vet records and it's some different you know, food and toys. So just think about, again, the, you know, the scenario is you're quickly grabbing this backpack or duffel bag throwing it in your car and you're evacuating your home and you don't know how long you're going to be gone, but probably at least a day or two, if it's a, a wildfire type scenario, what are the things that you would want to have? You know, of course you can add to this list, but this is sort of the basics of where you're going to start. So for go bags, I have some pictures here of what is in my go bag. This is my kit and my story is last summer, I had just moved into my new house off island and I was here on Bainbridge at work and I got a alert on Pulse Point that there was a wildfire right across the street from my home. And so I called my husband, he looked outside, he said, yep, there's a fire. Now, luckily it was contained really quickly um, you know, there wasn't an ongoing threat from this incident, but when I got home, because we had just moved, I hadn't updated our bag. And so it really kicked me into gear to update our go bag. So this gives you an idea of how I have my supplies organized. So if you look at the upper left corner, that's all of the items for my dog, for Daisy. So I have treats and there's little poop bags and her food. There's a leash and an extra collar in that Ziploc. And then right next to it is all my PPE. So being still you know, in the middle of COVID, I have N95s and KN95s. There's a couple pairs of gloves and hand sanitizer in there. So all the things that I would need to protect myself are in that bag. And then I have a couple different first aid kits. You can see in the lower picture, there's three. And so they're kind of all stacked on top of each other in this upper left photo, band-aids. Um, you know, the, the larger Johnson & Johnson first aid kit also has, I think, Advil and uh, a couple other different medications, Neosporin, things like that, alcohol wipes. So a couple different first aid kits, whistles. I have the extra um, plastic bags, and then just kind of going through that kind of lower left section, there's ponchos and blankets. We live in the Pacific Northwest. I definitely don't want to get caught in the rain without some protection. Um, and then Mylar blankets for warmth. That middle photo here is water. So emergency water packets. There's many different brands. So I'm not endorsing one particular brand, but I do like the fact that they have a longer shelf life than just a couple bottles of water that you know you might pick up from the grocery store and i have two life straws in there and then to the right of that are glow sticks and batteries and flashlights i also keep in my vehicle i have a headlamp that's in my glove box and then is to the right of that is the hand crank radio flashlight portable charger and just kind of a sampling of all of those items. And I have them individually sorted. You can see that there's written on the, on each Ziploc with a Sharpie of what's in it. And then all of them are kind of stacked into this duffel bag that we keep. We keep it under our stairwell. It's right near the front door. It's an easy spot for us to grab it and go. Um, and then the, the last kind of set of items that are in there on the lower right, I have a rope, a little portable emergency stove, another whistle, another backup radio. There's water sanitation tablets in there. There's a knife. Um, and then I've added some other items to this, including that Ziploc I mentioned with our key documents and cash. So we have all of that ready to go if we need. And you know, the other piece of the planning puzzle when you're putting together your go bag is to think about, is there anything else in your house, particularly in a wildfire scenario, but it could be a, a flooding king tide tsunami type scenario as well. What's in your house that is a value to you and your family that you might wanna grab? So having that difficult conversation of, if we are in a situation where our property is threatened, what would we wanna grab? 
Maybe it is some sentimental family items, photos, paintings, you know, whatever it is, just make a list of those things so that you know, okay, these are the items that we would quick, quickly grab and add to our go bag. So that's just something I wanted to share a little bit about what prompted me to get our bag up to date and the items that I have in there. Someone asked how much cash they should have in their go bag. How much cash? So, you know, it's kind of a personal preference. I think in general, if you have somewhere between, you know, 60 to hundred dollars, that's a great start. You know, the idea is if you're in a scenario where you're, you're quickly evacuating and, you know, depending on the emergency situation, you may not have access to get to an ATM to get cash, or you might be going places where if we're out without power, there's no ability to swipe a credit card. You just want something that could get you a meal, get you a couple gallons of gasoline and go from there. So at least 60 to hundred dollars would be my recommendation. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, Ian wants to know, uh, where do you keep your bag? You've got a number of kits you're going to talk about in this presentation. Do you keep them in the same place? There's some overlap between the kits. Do you have each one standalone or is it a, an assembly and you grab what you need when you need it? Great question. Okay, so I'll talk about me specifically where all of my items are, and then maybe that will help you. Everyone's household is a little bit different. And so I, I want to keep it kind of as high level as I can. But in general, because of how my house is laid out, all of my emergency household emergency supplies are in the black and yellow plastic tubs from Costco, and they're stored out in my garage. My go bag, as I mentioned, is stored underneath the stairwell because that's the easiest location for us to grab it and go. And then obviously I have my kit in my car and I have a backpack at work. And so I like to have everything separated. It's just easier. I know what's in them. I know what supplies need to be rotated for expiration dates, all of that. And so that just seems to work well for, for me. Now, obviously all the items in my go bag if I'm at home and I'm staying at home, can also help supplement whatever else is in my home emergency kit. So I think the best thing to do is just to survey your residence and figure out the best place to keep everything. I know a lot of folks have storage sheds out in the back, and so that can be a really great place, especially if you're keeping them in you know air and water tight tub containers. That is a good source um, to store depending on the age of your home and the likelihood of there being additional earthquake damage, it can be a great idea to keep things in a separate structure. If that um, is an option, if you live in a condo or an apartment or a townhouse, I know, you know, space is a premium. And so you might just need to keep everything in one particular closet. Um, it just depends. Um, if you have really specific kind of weird questions that you want to ask me, I'm happy to, you know, talk to folks after this uh, webinar. You can send me an email or give me a call. Um, like I said, everyone's situation is just a little bit different, but you can kind of analyze your home and figure out what works best for you. We've got a couple other general questions. How many days of food and water should you prepare? In so we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit about that for your home. For a go bag, I would say, you know, a, a day or two of just snacks and water is a good start. You, you think if you're in a wildfire or a flood or a, you know, tsunami type evacuation scenario, you're probably going somewhere else if you can, right? You're either going to go to a shelter or you're going to go stay at a hotel or you're going to go stay with family. So it's really just to sustain you for that interim while you are evacuating and getting as, as far away as you can, wherever you need to go. So at least a day or two for your go bag. Okay, someone points out about medications that some are temperature sensitive and you might not be able to store them in your car due to heat or cold issues, depending on the time of year. And Absolutely. then someone else asks, given the experience of cashlessness during COVID and also current traveling, is cash really appropriate? Should you also have something like a a low value travel cash card in your bag? So certainly, so let me ask, answer the question first about medication. So I know there are 
like cold packs that you can purchase, particularly if you're traveling with insulin or, um, you know, syringes or vials that need to be refrigerated or kept at a certain temperature, but there are travel cold packs that you can purchase at the pharmacy. And so that's a really good resource. If you're, you know, you, again, something for you to keep in mind, if you're evacuating and you keep a medication in your fridge, make sure someone is assigned to grab that as you're going. And then you can have that cold pack as an option to keep it cool. The other thing would be obviously grab a small cooler, have some ice, do what you can to keep those medications at the appropriate temperature, but that should be a part of your planning process. For cash, um, a gift card, a, you know, a visa card, something like that that's preloaded is, is not a bad idea. But the other concern with that is again, thinking about you're without power the only way we can trade, we can buy things, right, is either to, to barter or to pay with cash or coin. And so I don't want to lose that. I mean, yes, a lot of places has gone cashless, have gone cashless, but at the same time, in a disaster scenario, that might be our only option. So if you want to do both, that is great, but I would still advise on having cash. Any other questions? All for now. Okay. Um, here's another example of just kind of a simple kit that you can put together. This is my personal kind of what I call my daily emergency kit. It's a quart size Ziploc, and this goes with me pretty much everywhere. I keep it in my work bag, and then I have something similar in one of my purses. And so these are just kind of the things I feel like everyone should have on them at all times. So poncho, mylar blanket a first aid kit, a CPR mask, a tourniquet, and a whistle. I just never know. Hopefully I never need these items, but if I do, then I have them. Someone changed the language to French. Did anyone see that? I don't know how to do that. Now my captions are in French. All right. I don't know how to change that. <laughs> Thank you, whoever changed it back to English. <laughs> That's unique. Um, okay, so just wanted to throw that out there. Something that I think um, is a really simple kind of first step that you can take. And most of these items, other than the tourniquet, are obviously also extremely affordable. You could go to the Dollar Tree or 99 cent store and get these items and, and piece it together. All right, now let's talk a little bit about workplace and, and car emergency supplies. So I'll use the city as an example. So here at City Hall, when we onboard new staff, everyone gets a backpack and then I give them a Ziploc full of a water pouch, a blanket, a poncho, a whistle. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here in the type of items that we recommend, um, an N95 and a glow stick. And so everyone starts with that. I think that just to have these basics in a backpack are really great. Of course, you wanna add in some snacks, a cell phone charging cable, or even better are the little cell phone power banks. Those are a really great thing to have. So, you know, everyone's situation is a little bit different as we've been talking about. So feel free to customize those type of items. But again, if you're, if you're going into your workplace and you are, stuck there, what are items that you want to have? And every work site is different. I know the type of emergency supplies that we have here at the city. So all of our city facilities are kitted out with various items. Ask the question of your workplace. What do you have on site if something happens and we're stuck here? How much water? How much food? First aid supplies? Are there stop the bleed kits? What are the items that are on site? And then what might you want to have to supplement? Same thing for your car. I also have kind of a, a winter car emergency kit. And then in the summer, I take it out because I have a lot of extra items that I just don't need. But I like to have these things in my car as well. So a jumper cable, cable flares or reflective triangles, just if you get in a car accident and you're off the side of the road, things that can make your vehicle visible to traffic. An ice scraper actual maps i mean it depends on how well you know the area but physical maps are a great thing when our phones aren't working and gps isn't working uh, maybe even a compass cat litter or sand this is really great for helping with tire traction it particularly when there's ice and snow 
a warm jacket, you know, maybe things like extra gloves, a scarf, a blanket, a sleeping bag. Again, for your car in particular, if you're if you think about a situation where you're driving home, we're in inclement weather and you get stuck, would you be able to comfortably and safely stay in your vehicle until help arrives? So if you're waiting for AAA or a family member to come get you, but again, we're, we're in an inclement weather type situation, we want to make sure that you are safe, you are warm and protected in your vehicle. So this is a, an initial list to help get you started and think through those particular items for your situation. We didn't talk about glasses, contacts, things like that, but if there are items that you use day to day, you wanna make sure you're thinking about having extras in each of these types of emergency kits. So any questions on workplace and car emergency supplies? All right, not seeing any. I just like this graphic. Nothing really to say other than I thought it was cute. All right, so now moving on to your house. So first I wanna say, I know this can seem very overwhelming, especially when you look at all of the different handouts and lists that are out there. But the good news is you probably have 70% of this in your house already. You just need to start organizing it and putting it in your home emergency kit. So first and foremost, water. The recommendation is a gallon of water per person per day and per pet. And then also thinking about some sort of water filtration device or a sanitizing tablet. There are many different ways to meet this requirement. So think through space availability. Do you have a cistern? Do you get five gallon water bottles delivered? You know, what are the different ways that you can help meet this, this need? Personally, for my household, we have bottled water that we purchase from Costco. We have the water pouches, we have canned water, we have kind of a mix of all of this. I know a number of folks on the island have cisterns, you can purchase 55 gallon plastic water drums. There's lots of different things you can do, but I think the place to start is to think about what does that mean? So how much one gallon of water per person and pet per day for at least 14 days, how much water is that? And then you can start doing the math, you know, the reverse math on all of the different options based on your, your space. Now, do you live near a stream? Do you live near some other water source? Do you feel like you could access the water in your water heater? We wanna think through all of those options and figure out how much we really need to, to store. I will say that's one thing that on the Bainbridge Prepare side, we are working on putting together a team of people to think through some guidance and share best practices. So we will have more information to share on this, um, some, some real specifics and training videos. That's one of our goals for the year, but in the interim, just some information that can get you started to think through the different options that we've talked about. For food, 14 to 30 days of non-perishable food. So canned goods, I also want you to think through how are you cooking the type of food that you're storing? I am a fan of the freeze-dried Mountain House, and there are many other brands out there, Augustin Farms. If you go to REI or at Costco, or you look on Amazon, there are a number of different brands out there. They're all fine. Just pick something, think about the needs of your family, are there dietary concerns? And also think through, are there just foods you don't like to eat? Now, maybe in a disaster, you'll eat whatever is in front of you and that's fine. But if you don't like fish, don't stock up on a bunch of canned tuna or canned salmon. Think through what are the types of foods that you enjoy eating that you would want to have in your emergency supplies. So peanut butter, other nut butters, obviously um, you know, canned beans and vegetables and fruit and all of those different options, but 
if you want to get really creative, there are tons of websites out there that actually lay out creating a meal plan for your disaster kit and thinking through what would I want to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So maybe some cliff bars and peanut butter for breakfast. And if you like canned tuna, a canned tuna and cracker pack for lunch, and then a freeze-dried meal for dinner. There's a lot of options. So just do a couple searches, think about what you want. And again, if you have specific questions, I'm more than happy to answer them either on here or, or after the fact. Other things to think through, first aid kit, flashlights, lanterns, headlamps. I, I am a huge fan of headlamps because if it's something you're wearing on your head, your hands are free to, you know, if you're performing first aid or you're doing a safety check in your house, um, something that you know, freeze up space, freeze up your hands. So headlamps are, are a great resource. Multi-purpose tool, work gloves, a NOAA weather radio, or just a, you know, a hand crank, some kind of radio in general, so you can get AM, FM channels, a camp stove or a barbecue, extra propane or extra charcoal, whatever, you know, a lot of folks grill at home. So you might already have some amazing barbecue at home. So just do you have extra pro propane? So that could be your source of cooking in an emergency. Extra clothes, jacket, sturdy shoes, a whistle, personal hygiene items, a portable toilet. Um, you know, a lot of folks have gotten really creative with using a five gallon bucket as your portable toilet. And I'll, I'll share a picture of that in a moment, something fun that you can do to be prepared at home. We talked a little bit about copies of key documents and cash, extra prescriptions, glasses, contacts. If you wear glasses or you have contacts, make sure you have extras in, in your kit. The other thing with prescription medication, take pictures of the prescription so that you know the name and the exact dosage. And then when that changes, take an updated photo. So you have that on your phone, you want to print out or make photocopies of the actual hard copy prescription, that's a great thing to have. One of the challenges is a lot of individuals, they know perhaps the name of the medication, but they don't know their dosage. And so if you were to leave your house and show up at a shelter or show up somewhere needing assistance and you don't know, it's very difficult to replicate that information. And that was something that was seen quite frequently, particularly after Hurricane Katrina, all these individuals showed up at their local shelters and said, yeah, well, I take blood pressure medication. Okay, what kind? Ooh, I don't know the exact name. And there are a lot of generic names out there and they had no idea of the dosage. So it makes it very difficult to get individuals the prescription help they need when you don't know that information. So I would highly recommend you have that when at any time it changes, you update your records. And in terms of having extra prescriptions on hand, depending on your insurance, I know some companies will allow you to get 90 day supply. And so order as often as you can refill. And then every time just try to set aside one or two pills until you have you know, at least seven days worth. It might be impossible to have a 60, 90 day supply on top of what you actually have on hand to use. But if you can set aside one or two pills every time and reorder as soon as you can so that you always have additional prescriptions on the way. And then last, some additional considerations around generator, solar, battery power backups. There's a lot of different technology out there. Jackery is one that's a, a really great battery power backup. Goal zero is another, again, not trying to endorse any particular company, but there are some that I just have more experience in using. Um, solar can be a good resource when we have sun, of course. And then just if you, if you have a generator, make sure you know how to use it. You have the appropriate fuel. There are dual and tri-fuel generators out there that are a really great resource. And I know some folks, if you have the means to have a whole house generator, that's great as well. So questions on building your home preparedness kit.
looking at the yeah is it better to have canned food rather than dried food because there's some water in it so certainly um you know again it's it's kind of personal preference as well but canned food is great you just have to watch expiration dates make sure you have a can opener or you have the pop top cans dried food if you do have a lot of dried food you want to think through having some water and the cooking considerations for what you have so good good question there are also emergency food pouches that don't require adding water but the thing that i like about the emergency food is they tend to have a longer shelf life and so if you would rather have a one time investment then you know you might pay a little bit more up front but then you don't have to rotate it as often uh, i answered this question in another query, what type of tourniquet do you recommend? We like the SAM, S-A-M, and CAT, C-A-T tourniquets. They both uh, have a Velcro or hook and loop closure for the initial application. And then they have a windlass that you turn to do final tightening. And then there's a little hook you can pop the windlass into. Uh, the SAM may be a little bit easier to do a self-application. You can also cut off a little bit more if there's a lot of extra length left over without taking away a lot of the, the um, Velcro so that you don't have that flapping around, might get caught and undo the tourniquet. But they're both good. Uh, suggest anything with a windlass, the SAM or CAT tourniquets. Uh, Laura asks, is a multi-purpose tool that you brought up like a scout knife or Swiss Army knife? Yeah, so certainly. So a multi-purpose tool, something that would have like a knife, a screwdriver. Um, certainly, you know, there are there's also non-sparking tools for utility shutoff. So those would be different than a Swiss Army knife, but absolutely both of those items would be great to to have in your kit. If your water bottles expire, can you replace the water with tap water? Should it be treated when it's replaced? And how long can you store tap water? Okay, that's a great question. So I would recommend that you don't replace the water in, and I'm assuming you're asking about plastic water bottles. They really are supposed to be for one-time use. And so what I do personally is I know what the expiration dates are. And so I just swap them out before they expire. And if for some, re some reason I have missed that, I use them to water plants. I keep them, you know, so I'm still using the, the water, but I would not recommend replacing the, the water with tap because the challenge with plastic is you do have chemicals that eventually leach out of the plastic and would get into your water. So I would not recommend that. The water doesn't expire. It just gets plastic exposure. Correct. Uh, Correct. Jane says, hey, in your toilet kit, add toilet paper. Absolutely. Don't overlook the, the TP. Absolutely. Toilet paper, paper towels. You want to have things like that. Uh, see, I see a question about cisterns. So, you know, cisterns are great if you have the space. There are certainly some best practices in how you, you know, collect that water and how you treat that water to make it uh, potable. Those are things that we are going to work on. I mentioned we're, we're working to put together our, our water team and have some best practices. So cisterns is definitely one thing that we want to focus more on. Water is going to be very important post-disaster. And if you don't have it, you're going to have to go get it somewhere. So store what you can. Uh, if you're part of a Map Your Neighborhood group, perhaps work with your neighbors to find a place where you can store that together. Go in on the cost of a cistern or water barrels. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. All right, great, thank you. All right, so moving on, just a couple photos I wanted to share. So the photo on the right, this is one of our Map Your Neighborhood neighborhoods. Uh, Carol Appenzeller and her neighbors had a, you know, build your portable toilet party with five gallon buckets and pool noodles. So just kind of a fun thing that you can do with your neighbors and a, a really great resource to have in your emergency kit. And then on the left, this is another example from one of our Map Your Neighborhood captains on how they organize all of their important documents. So they bought this uh, you know, file folder uh, off Amazon and the particular little 
inserts and you can see that they have it by estate records, financial records, medical records and photographs, personal records, and then real estate and insurance records. So this is a, a really great example of how to organize all of your key documents and then keep it in a file box that is great to grab and go if you need. And I believe that she said she keeps this in her front, the front, like inside the front door in that front closet so she could grab it and go if needed. And it's just there and organized and every year once a year at least to go in and, and update it. So I just wanted to share those photos so you can see some examples. All right, uh, kind of last few points on all the different things that we need. We talked a little bit about this with your go bag, but again, for your, your household, think about any particular, you know, just special considerations based on your household. Do you have infants? small children with particular needs like formula, diapers, baby wipes, toys, things to keep them occupied, books, puzzles, games, anything that you would wanna have. The other thing with, particularly with children is make sure you are keeping age appropriate photos in your emergency kit. And same thing with pets, make sure you have, you know, age appropriate as, as your kids age, as your pets age, take updated pictures and keep that in your emergency kit. It's also a good idea to have a photo of the family, have everyone in your household in one picture, a picture of you with your pet, particularly when it comes to animal reunification. If your pets get out, one thing that they like to see is a photo of you with your dog, with your cat, with your bird, your goat, whatever the pet is that you're trying to, to locate, make sure you have photos of your animals with the family and again appropriate food supplies related to your children vet records for your pets we talked a little bit about that and then in particular for older family members or just anyone with a disability access or functional need make sure that you have the appropriate medical equipment wheelchair if it's a power wheelchair you have the ability to charge it you know, if it's a, a, a cane, any type of durable medical equipment, CPAP machine, anything that you're using day to day in your household, make sure that you have a plan to provide backup power or extra medication. A lot of the things that we've already covered. So before we move on, any other questions on items, things you need to purchase, things that you need to have in your kits? All right, so moving on. So we've talked a lot about the different types of kits and what you need in them, where to store them. Beyond that, I want you to think through what plans you might wanna have in place. So in particular, let's talk a little bit about just putting together a plan for your household. If you have children in school or at daycare or away at a camp, make sure that wherever you are dropping them off has a list of who is authorized to come and pick them up. This is a really important thing, particularly for the post-earthquake scenario. If you are someone who works off island, you work in Seattle, you work elsewhere in Kitsap, you may not be here to pick up your child from school or from daycare when something happens. So we at Bainbridge Repairs and our child safety team has worked really hard with the school district as well as our, our private schools on the island and our daycares on the island. There's something called the top 10 list that gets turned in every year to the school district of who is authorized to come and pick up your kid. So this could be a neighbor, a friend, another family member, but trusted individuals who are authorized to go and pick them up from school, from daycare, from camp. So that's really important. The other piece is to ask questions, ask questions of the schools, of the school district, of the daycare. If they go to a Sunday school at a, a religious organization, think through and ask those questions of those organizations as well. What is your plan if something happens while my child is in your care? So we wanna to continue to have these conversations and make sure there are plans in place and that you know what that plan is. 
another good piece of the, the planning process. Think about where would we meet if we can't get home? Is there a neighborhood gathering point, particularly if you are a part of a map your neighborhood community? Where's your neighborhood gathering point? Maybe it's the library, maybe it's Safeway, maybe it's TNC. Is there a place that you would go and meet up if you can't get to your home? Identify that and put together an emergency contact list. So if you don't have your cell phone on you, how many phone numbers do you know offhand? So it's a great idea to have a printed emergency contact list, you can handwrite it on a three by five card or print it off on your computer but just have that, keep that in all of those different kits. So I know my mom's phone number, my husband's phone number, my doctor's phone number, the neighbor, my out of state contacts. I have a printed hard copy of my emergency contacts. And the idea of including out of state contacts is that in a post earthquake scenario, our cell phones are gonna be overwhelmed. And sometimes it's easier to get a call or a text message out to an out of state number. And so you all have a family member, if you have someone that lives out of state or out of the area that is assigned, hey, everyone's gonna check in with Aunt Linda in California after something happens. And so you know, and Aunt Linda knows, everyone's gonna be checking in with her so that she can report back and say, yes, everyone checked in, everyone's okay, or I haven't heard back from so-and-so. And then of course, we've talked a little bit about map your neighborhood, but having a neighborhood plan, whether you go through the formal map your neighborhood process or just in general, talk with your neighbors, make sure that you know, okay, this is our plan. And if you go through the formal map your neighborhood process, even better, because we help map out, here's where all the propane tanks are located. Here's where the other utility shutoffs are. Here are the things that we need to know, as well as that asset inventory. So you know who in your neighborhood is CPR trained, who's a doctor, who can help with first aid, et cetera. There are a number of different forms and you know plans out there. We've tried to really simplify. So between BainbridgePrepares.org and the city of Bainbridge Island website. And I'll, I'll share some links in the chat in a minute. There's some really great resources that help simplify this process. So questions about planning. Bob asks if Bainbridge has a list of mapped neighborhoods. Yes, and we can share that link. So there is a link on the city website with a map of all of the different neighborhoods that have gone through this process. So I'll post that in the chat in a minute. He also wonders if um, there are key contacts, so the captains. Uh, yes, so we don't publish that. So if you find that your neighborhood is mapped, you just need to email me and I can share who the, the captain is for your neighborhood. Any other questions? There's one question about sat phones. Might want to pen that for now. Okay, I can come back to that. All right. So how do you stay informed? So first, the city of Bainbridge uses Nixle. So this is our emergency text communication system for Bainbridge Island. We have the ability to send text messages, emails, and app notifications through the Everbridge app. If you have never signed up for Nixle, I will post in the chat how you can sign up. Essentially, you text our zip code 98110 to 888777, and that's how you sign up for Nixle. If you spend time Outside of Bainbridge Island, you can also sign up for the Kitsap County alerts. They use RAVE. If you spend time in other areas, there are you know versions of this in most other jurisdictions across the country. I know some folks spend half the year here on Bainbridge and half somewhere else. So do the research and contact your local emergency management agency in those other areas to find out. There is also something in the United States called the Wireless Emergency Alert System, or WIA. And I like to think of it as 
it's the same technology as our Amber Alerts, but instead of an Amber Alert, you would be able to, and by you, I mean emergency management organizations are able to draw a geofence over a certain geographic area and get out an emergency message. So this would be um, if you're in Tornado Alley and there's a tornado warning, or if you're somewhere where there's a tsunami warning. So most larger emergency management agencies, so we don't have this authority for Bainbridge, but Kitsap County does, Washington State does, they could draw a geofence and get an alert out and it would ping all of the cell phones that are within that range. So all of the towers and all the cell phones that are broadcasting um, through those towers is how they would get out a, a text alert for a, a truly emergent situation. And so we do have the ability to do that, whether you're signed up or not. But in general, it's a good idea to stay informed with your local emergency management office and of course, follow those accounts on social media. So if it's a police department, fire department, emergency management, you know, try to have as you know, multiple ways that you stay informed of various emergencies. Any questions on that? All right. So our last couple slides are about how to get involved and, and what are we doing here to prepare Bainbridge Island? So within the Bainbridge Prepares Partnership, we offer a number of different trainings and a number of different teams for our, our residents. We have Community Emergency Response Team, our Bainbridge Island Emergency Medical Response Team. If you are a boat owner and you wanna sign up for our flotilla, this is a, a really critical team of individuals that will help us transport essential personnel and supplies to and from Bainbridge in the event of an emergency, as well as help with family reunification and patient transport. We have a medical reserve corps. If you are a credentialed medical provider, we would love to have you join the MRC. If you are a ham radio operator or you are interested in becoming a ham radio operator, we have our Bainbridge emergency auxiliary radio system. And then we have our hub support team. There are a lot of other teams beyond the few that I've mentioned here. If you're interested in any one in particular, just send me an email and I can get you information on training that's available and the work of those teams. But in, in general, we use what FEMA calls a whole community approach to preparedness. So every one, every business, every school, every nonprofit, Every tourist that comes to Bainbridge is a really key piece of our planning process. We want to make sure that everyone who spends time on Bainbridge Island is represented in our emergency planning. And the way that we have done this is we have worked to build out this three-way partnership between the city, the fire department, and Bainbridge Prepares. I'm not going to go into detail on all of these components, but I just wanna share that we put a lot of time and energy into thinking through how do we help prepare the community and how do we respond post earthquake, post fire, post winter storm, whatever that looks like. So on the Bainbridge Prepares website, I will post the link to all of the different teams that exist and you can go through and get more information. And if you have any questions, let me know. On that website, there's also links to reach out to the different team leads. So if you have some questions that you want to run by the team leads, they're happy to answer as well. Another really important piece that we've talked about a lot today is map your neighborhood. Map your neighborhood is really the foundation of how we are preparing the island. So you can see on the left, this map is a little outdated, but for the most part, it's representative of the different neighborhoods that have been mapped. And so the concept is you work with me or we have a new team lead for Map Your Neighborhood. Her name is Ann Cook. You, so you work with one of the Anns and we help you figure out how do you define your neighborhood. In general, it can be 15 to 20 households or if you live in a condo complex or you live in a defined HOA, we can work with the HOA. So you define your neighborhood. You pick you know, the, the number of households and the street addresses that are included. 
And then the first step is to start putting together a contact list. So if you're leading that charge for your neighborhood, you start putting together that contact list, find a date and time where most people are available, and then you reach out and say, hey, Anne or Anne, we're interested in hosting a kickoff meeting. You can do that in person at someone's house, or you can do it on Zoom. So we pick the date and time, and then one of our trainers comes and we go through the process. We talk a little bit about what it means to be in a mapped neighborhood. You complete a household inventory form for each household that's a part of the neighborhood. And then after the kickoff meeting, you put together a written plan so that you know, like we talked about earlier, this is our neighborhood gathering point. Here's our map of who's included and the propane tank shutoffs and other key utility shutoffs within our neighborhood. And you have a plan to help respond as a neighborhood when something happens. And so part of that process is checking on each household, making sure everyone is okay, conducting damage assessment, helping with first aid, doing what you can to you know, help your neighbors after something's happened. And so if you can imagine, with 25,000 residents and a number of tourists and people that spend their days on Bainbridge, there's a lot of people that will be on island that need help when something happens. So if you are prepared at home, you are prepared on your street within your neighborhood, then you are doing your part to help protect the community so that all 25,000 people don't show up at a hub. And I'm gonna talk about what that is in a second for help. And so if you are not a part of a mapped neighborhood or you're not sure, you can reach out to me and I will help get you information on how to do that. And if you are a part of a mapped neighborhood, thank you, because you are doing um, a huge service to you know, help the community be prepared. So I mentioned a hub. What is a disaster hub? A disaster hub is a site, and you can see on the map on the right, all of the different hub locations on island where we are prepared to help serve the community post earthquake. So we are working to build up our emergency caches. So we will have a trailer filled with, you know, first aid supplies, ham radio equipment, limited food and water, and a whole bunch of other things that will allow us to provide information and connect between each of these hub sites and the city's emergency operations center will provide some limited medical care and basic food and water, psychological first aid, and really just to be a resource within each of the different areas on the island after an earthquake. We are working with each of these sites to have formal written agreements. And I mentioned building up those emergency supplies. And then of course, to assign our volunteers to help staff each of these sites. So if you live near one of these hubs and you're not a volunteer, I would love to put in a plug to have you join. We are working on assigning volunteers to each of these sites and to really refine our plan to be able to provide this service to our community. And of course, we wanna connect up all of our hubs with their nearest mapped neighborhoods. And so each neighborhood would be able to send a representative from your mapped neighborhood to your nearest hub, report in that damage assessment, report in everything's okay, or we need help. And if everything's okay, hey, we can also provide support to the folks coming into the hub that need a place to stay or need a place to camp. Maybe you have a big yard and you wouldn't mind some folks setting up in a tent out back and to really help serve in this matchmaking post earthquake for various needs that are, that are going to come through our hub. So questions related to map your neighborhood or our disaster hubs. The only thing we have now is a question about the senior center and whether where it sits relative to the inundation zone for a tsunami. Great question. So the current uh, set of inundation maps for the Seattle fault do show some areas on island that are particularly vulnerable, but the senior center is okay. The water is not expected to get that far up and impact the senior center. And really, let me go back a slide. We removed Fay Bainbridge Park. So you may have seen older versions of this that included Fay Bainbridge, but Fay Bainbridge will, we expect, will be underwater 
post earthquake and, and tsunami. And so we have removed that as a, a camping hub location. So at this point, all of the sites that are identified are outside of the tsunami inundation zone. There could still be earthquake damage to the structure, but they are out of the tsunami inundation zone. All right, so a couple final slides. Just putting in a plug for our day of preparedness. The, the graphic is from last year, but for 2023, we'll be on Saturday, September 23rd from 10 to 1 here at City Hall. And we like to provide information, resources, on-site training. We have representation from all of our teams and community partners. So save the date, put that in your calendar. And another save the date is for the Great Shakeout, October 19th at 1019. The photo in the bottom right is my dog Daisy and I doing our drop cover hold on underneath my desk at home. I was working from home uh, on the shakeout last year. So make sure you practice drop cover hold on for good earthquake safety. And uh, we wanna make sure that we get more businesses and schools and everyone on island participating. And then some final call to action for all of you. So create your family reunification plan, join Map Your Neighborhood if your neighborhood is not mapped. We have a number of checklists for all of the different supplies that we've talked about today on Bainbridge Prepares. And then if you are interested in volunteering, there's a link here. And when I stop sharing my screen, I will post all of these links in the chat as well for your records. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or you can type it into the Q&A. And so while we're doing that, I'm going to paste all of these links into the chat. And when do you expect that the presentation will be made available to people who signed up for the webinar? Great question. So usually it takes a couple hours for Zoom to do its thing and get me a recording link that I can share. And so I plan on emailing it out tomorrow morning to everyone that signed up, and then we will have it posted on our YouTube page in a couple of days. And I will also share a link to the Bainbridge Prepares YouTube page in the chat. This is a great resource for a lot of the different trainings that we've offered. We record them when we can and put them on our YouTube page. What other questions? Okay, in the case of the big one, earthquake, we're at home, but the home is destroyed, but with some access to emergency supplies. So Kathleen's question is, do we hunker down near home? or head to an evacuation shelter location? So I would hunker down at home, absolutely. And you know, basically, if you have a tent, you have all of your emergency supplies, get what you can, bring them outside, and make sure you are you know, far enough away from your house that you're still safe. But if you are in a, in a place where your property is safe and you can safely, you know, shelter in place outside of your residence, then that is the recommendation. We have limited options for shelter on island, even within that hub network I mentioned. And so if you are able to stay you know, on your property or perhaps even within your neighborhood, that is number one. And then if it's not safe for you to do that, or there's nowhere for you to stay within your neighborhood, then you would come to your nearest disaster hub for support. Next burning question is, how do I get a map your neighborhood process going for my neighborhood? Yep. So send me an email. I will type my email into the chat and uh, we'll get going. We'll make it happen. That's all the questions we have in the chat at the moment. All right. Here we go. Should we shelter on island if one of the volcanoes go off? Would falling ash make it unsafe? That's a good question. So if you if you look at the mapping for you know Mount Rainier or some of the other volcanoes, I feel like we would be okay. Certainly air quality would be a concern, and that's where having N95s and box fans, air filters, things that we do in wildfire smoke situations where the air quality index is poor, you're still better off 
staying put. But with that being said, I think each situation would be evaluated. If there were a bigger threat to Bainbridge, we'd be coordinating with the county and the state emergency management to kind of understand what the recommendations are. Part of the challenge is if we all have to evacuate, you know, where are we going? And more than likely going east uh, would be a challenge as well as just getting off island and, and driving around. So in some situations, it might be safer to, to shelter in place. Okay, an encouragement for more questions, if you have them, to go into the Q&A. Another follow-up to the big one. How do I let the city know I'm okay? Uh, how I let the city know I have an emergency and need help? I'm assuming no electricity, cell coverage, or broken roads. So that is where the hubs come into play. So if you are in a mapped neighborhood, you're going to connect up with your neighborhood captain, get that damage assessment or needs assessment information to your captain. The captain will go and report that into the nearest hub. Now, if you're not in a map neighborhood, your hub is still that local connecting point to the city. Everyone on island lives within two miles of a hub. And so if you can safely walk there, then that's where you would share your information to say, I need help um, or, or you know, everything's good and I'm here to help. And then there was Chuck's question about the sat phones. There are a number of different resources out there to, you know, purchase satellite um, internet, sat phones for your house. There are Garmin inReaches, there's Zolio. There are a number of different uh, devices out there that you might want to invest in. I don't have one particular recommendation, but if you have the finances to support some type of satellite subscription, I think it's a, it's a great idea. It's a good addition. Um, another plug for cam radio as well. That's another great way that we can stay connected when cell phones are down. Any other final questions? If not, my email is in the chat. I posted some links to Bainbridge Prepares, the city website, as well as our Bainbridge Prepares YouTube page. Feel free to click on those links, look through all the different information. And if anything comes up after the fact, send me an email and I'm happy to help. I have three questions. Uh, and let's start with what role do ham radio operators play in the plan? Does the city use bears to communicate info and should residents find a bears contact commun to communicate with the city? So we will have someone from the Bears team, one of our ham radio operators at each hub. So that is our primary way of communicating from hub to hub and from hub to the emergency operations center. And so that's why each of the hub sites really serves as that connecting point between all of our residents and the, the city. And so all official communication will kind of go upstream and downstream through the hub so that we can get information from the community to the hubs, to the city, and then back down from the city to the hubs, to the community. Uh, Linda has a good question for people who aren't yet volunteers. Do you want all volunteers to register with the city? Yes, absolutely. So if you are wanting to volunteer, we have an, an emergency management volunteer application form that is posted on the city website and on Bainbridge Prepares. The reason that we ask you to register and is to have you credentialed so you become an emergency management volunteer, you have protection from the state uh, when you're activated in an emergency, there's liability protection, and you get badged as Tyler's holding up his ID badge, and then you can participate in all of the additional trainings that we have available to our volunteers. Given our proximity to Canada, if we could and needed to leave the area, is there some cross-border emergency agreement that would allow Northern Washington residents to easily evacuate North? So there's no official agreement out there. We have had conversations with Vancouver Island in the past. Um, we certainly have a great working relationship with some of the emergency management agencies uh, in British Columbia. So some of that conversation would happen just in time. And then certainly we, you know, through our flotilla and through our, our partnerships, try to continue to have those conversations. Um, I don't know that we'll ever have an official memorandum of understanding, but 
we would have the ability to request support from Canada, from British Columbia, and would hopefully be able to figure out in the moment, you know, what those options are. The last thing that we have in the Q&A at the moment is, are there plans in place for possible radiation leaks from the military facilities in Kitsap? There are. So, I mean, the best protective action for you, you know, in your home is to shelter in place. And so we want to make sure that we would provide that information to you just in time. So again, being signed up for Nixel, we'd be able to share that information. And the, the action item is to shelter in place, stay inside your home, seal up, you know, close your windows, turn off your air conditioning. Um, if you can get to an interior room, and basically, you know, again, you know, kind of going along with the sheltering in place, time, distance, and shielding from the radioactive material is your, your best line of defense. And so the longer you can stay inside and uh, distance yourself and shield yourself from the radioactive material that's outside, the, the better off you are. And so that allows time for the radioactive material and half-life all of the things that go into radioactive uh, radiological response to be put in place. It could also be an evacuation type scenario. It really just depends on what's going wrong, what we know, what we have been able to gather from our, our military partners and then provide the best protective action to the community. But we are very engaged. Uh, Kitsap County DEM is engaged with our Navy counterparts and we would have the opportunity to coordinate response efforts. Good question. New question just came in. Seems like it's a little bit of a two-parter. Seems that it will be necessary to go in person to the hub to report neighborhood status. Uh, first of all, I'll mention that there's generally per neighborhood one designated person who will be chosen to report to the hub. That'll be the, the haves. Here are the resources that this neighborhood can provide to the greater community through the hub. The hub can do that matchmaking and then also report the neighborhood's needs. Uh, so in person is kind of the de facto mode, but the follow up to that is, will there be a way to contact someone at the hub if phones are operable? So at this point, the planning assumption is that phones won't be operable, but I guess the other piece of it, you know, if your neighborhood's fine and you don't need anything and you don't have any resources to assist, then Initially, we don't really need to know, right? It's great that you're okay and you don't have to come just to say like, we're fine. The, the goal is if you're fine and you can also help, then we want you reporting into the hub to say like, we're great and here's what we can do to help. Um, if we are in a situation where phones are working, then we would be able to communicate with the, you know, with residents to say, report damage assessment information here. And so it wouldn't necessarily be to your hub, but we'd be able to get out a Nixle alert that says you can report in your neighborhood status to this phone number or this email. But our planning assumption at this point is post earthquake, cell phones, landlines won't be operational. And so that's why we don't have phone numbers assigned to our hubs. We're pl planning a pretty low tech uh, process, assuming that worst case earthquake scenario and uh, the hub will have an info board where you can collect up-to-date information that's coming down from the city based on best available information about the big picture and suggestions from the city about follow-up procedures to take. So it's good to check in there. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everyone for your time. As I mentioned, the recording will get posted on our Bainbridge Prepares YouTube page. I will email it out probably tomorrow morning to everyone that signed up and registered. I will also send it through our various listservs to our volunteer base, to our Map Your Neighborhood captains so that we can get the information out to the entire community. So thank you so much for your time and I hope you all have a wonderful day.